Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. But now I can see. But for some of us here, we might be able to say it this way. I once was filled with guilt but now I've been forgiven. I once was in a marriage where my marriage was broken and I was destroying the relationships with my mate and my family. But now I know what Scripture has to say and I've been delivered and I've got the marriage and the family of my dreams. I once was ambling, uh, ambling through life without any purpose or direction, just going from one job to another job, but I had no reason to be where, I'm, where I was at and what I was doing. But once I found Christ as my Savior, and I followed His teaching. I now know why I am here and where I'm going and what I can do for His glory. I have me. I once was blind, but now I see. Now I ask you, I hope you've trusted Christ and you have a good reason for your belief system, but has it taken you so far that you too can say, I once was blind, but now I see? I hope that would be the case because that's what happened to this man, and he used that. Sadly, I don't read where any of these Jewish people came to faith in Christ. But I can tell you this, he sure gave them an answer that those Jewish people could truly not argue against. He once was blind and truly he did see. Well, let's look at one more thing that can enable us to be able to get our spiritual sight. Go back to the passage again, only a few verses this time. And really what it is, it's really trusting God. Look at it here in verse 35. It says here, oh, let let me do this one more point. Notice what it says in verse 34. It says, You were born entirely in sins and you're teaching us. So they put him out. The question is, what did they put him out of? Anybody? Anybody know the answer to that? What did they put him out of? They put him out of what? The synagogue. Now catch what this is happening right here. You have mom and dad who had a perfect opportunity to point those people to Christ as the one who healed their son. They did not do it so they could retain their membership in the synagogue. This guy right here, he was willing to testify for Christ and he would get kicked out of the synagogue. Now stay with this thinking for a moment. You also saw the parents, probably their reason to stay there, one of them at least, was to stay within the social secure network that they had. They needed that network. If anybody would need a network, it would have been this guy. But now he can see, and now he can see so much that he knows that God could take care of him. Now, we don't read that specifically, but I thought that was interesting. Here's this guy. He's get, he gets kicked out of the, the, the network there of the, of the synagogue, and his parents stay in. So I'm now wondering, long term, what kind of a relationship now does mom and dad, will they have with this son and what divided it we could say christ divided that relationship or we could say is because neither one or one of them did not do what they should have done which was to surrender to christ and give him all the glory to bring them back together again and i'm just wondering if maybe some of the things that might unite our families even more tightly is when we're willing to stand up for christ no matter the cost together as a family and I, i'm not speaking to anybody that called and said i talked to my husband he needs to get with the program I'm just saying together, can you work together as a family and speak for Christ? I would encourage you to do that. Well, let's go back here. So talking about trusting them, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had put him out of the temple, that blind man who can see, and he found him. Now, when you see the word, and finding him, he said, do you believe, blah, blah, blah. You might be thinking, well, that means Jesus didn't know where he was. Actually, when it's talking about finding him, it wasn't like, where is he? You could... Look for something. You know it's upstairs in your room and you go up there and you get it and you say, I found it. We say it in our language like it was lost until it was found. This is just nothing more than I went to him, I approached him, and I have him now. And so it's basically, he's with me. So he found him. And he said to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? Take your pen and underline the word in the Son of Man because what's happening now is not just do you believe that what I said to you, do you believe it? Do you trust in me? That's the idea. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, this is what's so cool. When it uses the phrase Son of Man here, that's a very unique phrase. John doesn't use it very often, but when he does, he's, I believe, referring back to this boy, this young man, who I believe had that Jewish training because in the Old Testament, when Daniel and others would refer to 
God, the Messiah, as the Son of Man. It was like the Messiah who is coming. It's all wrapped up in prophecy. The coming Messiah, the Son of Man. Son of Man means all God becoming a man, the Son of Man. And so it was referring back to, do you see me as the one who was spoken about in the Old Testament, as God who is now man in front of you? So there's a lot of meat behind this one phrase that's happening at this particular point. Do you see who I am as the Son of Man? Do you believe in me? And the guy said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Again, underline the word in. There's a difference between believing what you say and now is the aspect of trusting in him. And then finally it says this. Jesus said to him, you've seen him. He is the one who is talking with you now. In other words, I'm speaking to you now. I'm the one. I am the son of man. I am the one prophesied to come. I am God in the flesh. Verse 38. And the man said, Lord, I believe. You might want to underline and mark that because this tells me something about this individual and I'd like to encourage some of you. This is a journey that this man was going on with his sight. Now look up here for a second. Remember when he was blind and he went over here to the water and he was washing that mud pack that the Lord put on his eyes off and he saw for the first time, can you imagine how it was beautiful to see color and all the things that he heard about, but now he sees the bird from which he heard the song, etc. So he's watching all of that. That was an instantaneous healing. However, spiritually, this is important, spiritually sometimes it's going to take you a lifetime of a process. In this case, it was a process of him coming to the Lord. First time, you'll find it in verse 11, he called him the man. Later on, he said, okay, he's the prophet. In other words, he's speaking for God. All right, he's a messenger for God. But that's all he was. Nothing different maybe than Isaiah or maybe Jeremiah. But he went from the man to now a special prophet to now... He is Lord, and I believe. So he went through this process of gradual sight. So enlightenment comes through stages in your life. And I imagine some of you, the more you're in the Word, the more truths are coming at you, you're seeing the Lord just come at you again in more technicolor. Now, let's talk about the season here. Probably there's two more difficult times for long-time preachers in a history of, of, of a calendar. One is Christmas, and the other is Easter. And some of you are saying, why would that be so hard for you as a preacher at Christmas and at Easter? Because you have this story about his birth and you preach it. Usually two Sundays a year. Two Sundays a year. Year after year after year after year after year. And although you'll have some new people come in, salt and peppered into your congregation, generally you have the same people. And you don't want to keep going back to the old file and picking out some of the new stuff. And you keep digging and it's, I've got to come up with something new, but I don't want to be cutesy about this. I want to make sure that it's a great truth, but I want to build on that truth because it's like a flower, a rose that's kind of popping open so I can smell it and see it. And then you've got Easter, the same thing. And generally, the people that come, they only come once a year. And when do they come? Easter. And what are they going to do? Hear that same Easter message, and yet there are 33,000 other Bible verses. And that's all they have to do. So the preacher says, how can I say the same old thing, a new way, and still get this message across? I know that's difficult, but I'd like you to know this. When you hold this book in your hand, you are not holding one of the best books that was ever written. You are, you're holding in your hand the living Word of God. That this book here, you will never understand it all. Do you know that I could preach all my messages every Sunday for the rest of my, my ministry career on the birth of Christ and I would still never plummet the depths of the meaning of all that's involved in the birth of Jesus Christ? Then you talk about his life and then you talk about his death. Then you talk about his resurrection. Then you talk about him coming back again in the kingdom. I will never be able to plummet this. And I'm going to tell you right now that that's what this whole enlightenment is. I'm enlightenment because I know that Jesus is the Lord, but I'm growing in my enlightenment as I'm understanding more about it. Go back to the passage again. Notice what it says here at the first part of verse 38. He said, Lord, I believe. He went from I'm enlightened to this, and then it says, and he worshipped him. Now, if you want to, I'd like you to mark that in your Bible because this is also very, very rich, folks. Do you remember... In the early part of John, it says we want to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. In other words, there's a right way and a wrong way in which to worship the Lord. This is recorded, and he worshipped him with no clarification and no correction. Why? Because he is worshipping him in spirit 
and in truth, which now means that the progression went, he's a man, he's a prophet, he's the Lord God's Savior, and now he is genuinely worshiping him. So he went from the enlightenment stage to a full commitment stage. Now, I know when you hear the word commitment, some Christians think, okay, I've got to commit my life and change this and stop this and start that and all that to go to heaven. Well, first of all, none of that is true. I don't do any of those deeds to go to heaven. But there is a commitment in order to be saved. And that commitment is simply this. I now believe that Jesus is the Lord. And now in the story, Christ is going to go to the cross. Today, he already went to the cross and rose again. So now we understand that that Jesus that did this is the same Jesus who died and rose again. I believe that in my head. Now, he says, if I trust in him as the one who died and rose again, and I now know it's not my works, religious or social, and I come to him and I'm saying, Lord, I believe in you. Watch this. When I fully, completely, and here's my word, only believe in Him, then I've made my commitment to Him in Him alone. And so now I'm committing my internal destiny to Him. I cannot fall back upon my baptism, my commandments, my religious rituals. I cannot fall into anything other than His grace and His mercy. And when I trust in Him, I'm trusting who He is. I'm trusting what He said. I'm trusting what He did. My whole faith is in Him. That's the commitment. And so some of you have got to come to that point that it's nothing of you, it is only Christ, and fully, completely, and only place your faith in Christ. Now, what should be your response after that? Well, I don't know what yours would be, but this man, he couldn't do anything else but worship him. Do you really worship him? That's another whole series of messages on what is worship, who do you worship, when do you worship, how do you worship, why do you worship? So I'll just say it simply this. You ascribe to the Lord his worth-ship because he is worthy because he is Lord and he's your Savior and faith alone in him. So, enlightenment moves to commitment once you're fully enlightened. Let's end with this one. What can enable us to get our spiritual sight? I really believe in this context it's going to be humility. Some of you will never see the Lord completely. You'll never get that enlightenment. You'll never be able to get your sight until you're humble. And I think... um, The first humility is simply to say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. You're the Savior. I'm trusting in you. I can't do anything. That's humble. Humility. Watch this. Watch this. Once you trust Christ as Savior, I think it's a continual life of humility if you want to continue to get more light. If you want to see the Lord more accurately, more deeply, more clearly, if you want to do that, it's going to take a consistent state of saying, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in my life. I'm thankful for who I am in Christ. I celebrate that I'm accepted in the beloved one, but Lord, I am still nothing and I need you. Without you, I can do nothing. There's a nice passage of scripture. And so that humility stays. And as long as you, brothers and sisters, and I stay humble before him, we bow our knees and our heart before him and say, Lord, we love you. You have a word for us. We want to know you. We need, we're desperate for you, Lord. We thank you for what we've seen. We've moved from glory to glory, but there's more, the grace to grace. I need more and more of you, and I want more and more. And as we have that humility, I'm going to tell you, you will learn more. If not, you're going to read the Bible in the morning or whenever you read it, and it becomes nothing more than a ritual so you can get through the Bible in a year and get it checked off. And that's not how you're going to grow and get more enlightenment. It's when you come and you say, Lord, teach me something today that I didn't know. Remind me of something that I am so sorry that I forgot. Lord, I want to see you more clearly. I'm going to promise you that that's a prayer that he wants to answer from humility. Let's go back to verse 39 and finish it through 41. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world so that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Now, I know if you're anywhere in the Bible, you're reading this and you're saying, Whoa! For judgment came in. I thought Jesus didn't come into the world to judge the world, but that through him the world might be saved. So there's a contradiction. This must not be true. What does that really mean? All right. Let me see if I could say it this way. When I was a youth pastor, we had a, we had a very extensive youth meeting. I had 400 kids coming out. There were junior high kids, and junior high kids can be real challenges. And so we had these kids. Carol and I made a commitment that no matter how bad a child would be, no matter what he would do, we would not kick him out of our youth group. We were always disappointed when parents would punish their children by keeping them from youth group because that's the very thing they need to be at. 
I understood what they meant because the kid often loved to come to youth group more than anything and this is the best hammer they could use with their kid. But I'm thinking, you've got to come up with something else. But don't, It's like saying, I, I, I'm going to punish you. Don't read your Bible. You know, I'm going to punish you. Don't be a Christian. I'm going to punish you. Don't share your faith. That doesn't make sense. Well, let me go back to this. So my commitment was, we will not kick any of them out. However, Carol and I got together and we said, but what are we going to do with these ragamuffins? And I said, I got an answer. I'm going to tell those kids that when they come, <clears throat> I'm not going to judge them. But if they themselves choose to live in a way that is disruptive to what we're trying to do, and I don't want to go through the whole list, then I'm going to say they brought the judgment on themselves and they're telling us that they do not want to be here at this season until they can be a part of the group. So in other words, we never kicked them out. They took themselves out. So we never officially judged them. I'm going to say you're playing some word language here. I wanted you to know that we really wanted those kids to know we loved them, but at the same time, they had to have a level of discipline. So what's happening here in this context is Jesus says, no, I didn't, I'm not, I didn't come into the world to judge you, but you will be judged. That's the point. I didn't come specifically, so I dropped the hammer on you. But when you choose not to believe, you will not have your sight, and you will still be in your sins, thus you'll be judged. What is he saying overall? It's going to take humility. It's going to have for you to say, I am blind, I cannot see, I am a sinner, and I need a Savior. Go back to the passage. Verse 40. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, We're not blind too, are we? Kind of a negative response again. And Jesus said to him, If you were blind, you would have no sin. What does that mean? If you were blind, and if you read the whole context now, because it's in the context of everything that's being said, if you were blind, you would humbly say to the Lord, I need you, Lord. You'd have the forgiveness of your sin, potentially in Christ at the cross, and you would be able to see. And so he's basically saying here is that you're still in your sins. But since you say, we see, you know, we got it all together, your sin really remains. How many of you, if I could ask you to maybe in your heart raise your hand on this, how many of you have a relative that um, says they really know how to go to heaven and yet you know enough of scripture that their belief system is contrary to what God has to say and no matter how often you lovingly in a wonderful relationship still give them the truth, they still walk around and they say, we see, we don't need what you have. In fact, we question what you have, we already see. How many of you have family members like that? That's our friends. There's no difference that was going on during this period of time. Well, my friend, I can give you scripture. I can parade people here that have been where you are. And finally, they come to the point to say, you know, I, I'm spiritually blind and I, I need God to, to give me my spiritual sight and I'm trusting Christ. I can do that. But there's going to have to come a time that only you can do business with the Lord. It's a time between you and the Lord where the Lord is going to now, today might be the day, that he says, you, if you trust in me, you'll have your sight. So no matter what I do, I can't save you. No matter what I preach, I can't save you. What I can do is to present the truth. Jesus did all these things. He is the Lord. It wasn't about just healing a guy who was blind because he only did that with that one guy. There's probably a lot of blind beggars in those days. He chose this one as an object lesson to show about what sight is. Watch this. So that you would see that Jesus is the Lord and to believe in him. Not just believe his word. That's the first step. But now you believe in him, which is the final step. And then you go out and you worship. I, I pray you do that. Now, for those of you that are Christians, Chuck Swindoll tells a story about a, a, an ophthalmologist. This ophthalmologist was such a neat guy, but he, he did only special eye surgery where he would take the highest magnifying glasses he could wear and he would do this like microscopic surgery on eyeballs and reattach certain parts. I don't know enough about the anatomy of, of an eye to, to work with an eye that a person who was blind, not in all cases, but in some, he would then repair and to fix and do those minutest things to bring about at least the, bata- the uh, not an, an anatomical um, process together where this person could see. Then he would cover up with gauze the eyes and then he would put them into a dark room for days as they would carefully watch the eyes. But then there would be a very special time with a very dim light. They would peel off that gauze And then the person who was blind would begin to blink and be able to see for the first time. Can you imagine if you're a fly on the wall and you watch this happen and you saw what this doctor did and you heard what this blind person now said, I 
I was blind, but I, I can see how excited you would be. But I think there's only one other person in that room that's just as excited. It would be this doctor who God so much trained and equipped to work with people that were blind so he could help a blind person to see. I said that to say this. Can you imagine those of you that have the greatest truth, Jesus Christ, the light of the world, and you could bring that truth to people who are spiritually blind and God in his sovereignty would use you to help that person come to know Christ as Savior. Can you imagine what you must feel like when you had that moment of leading that person to Christ? Can you imagine that our island right now is filled with thousands, tens of thousands of blind, spiritually blind people? And we now have the opportunity to share with them the story about God as a human baby who is there to grow, to go to a cross. Born to die so they could live. Can you imagine, can you imagine what it would be like to explain that to your mother, your father, your neighbor, your fellow worker, your classmate? You only have a few weeks, students, before you're out of school. You only have a few more times, but you'll be with the students. Some of you are going to go home for a while on this holiday and come back again. You only got a few places to stop. But while you're there, you see yourself as a God-appointed spiritual ophthalmologist to give the message everywhere you go and let God bring about sight, spiritual sight. I'm so glad that we're a part of this divine physician. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed. In a moment, we're going to have a time of prayer. But right now, I'd like to give you a moment for you to reflect on the greatness of God. There are four truths that will hinder us from seeing him. I pray that it's not an either-or thinking. I pray that you're not flooded with doubt or man-made religious systems or even fear that you know the truth, but you won't step over the line like the parents. They knew the truth, but they wouldn't step over the line. That's going to hinder you from ever seeing spiritually. Step over the line of faith. Would you do that? Some of you, maybe you need to know what will enable you to see. And I pray that you see how wise it is to come to the Lord. How that He is there to help you, to guide you, to give you that sight. And so I'm going to ask, is there anyone here today that is ready to say, I believe that Jesus is the Lord and now today I'm going to trust in him for all my salvation. You're coming to him without a belief system of good deeds. You're coming to him humbly just as you are, a sinner with a horrible track record, a sinner in whom the Lord not only loves but delights because he went to the cross for you and he's waiting. Would you trust him as your savior now? Would you say something like this, Lord, I know I've done things wrong and I know I'll still do things wrong, but Lord, I want to see spiritually. I want to get that. And right now, Lord, I believe that you're the Lord who died and rose again. I don't understand it all. I'm still on this journey. I'm going from grace to grace, knowledge to knowledge, but I know enough to know that you're the savior and I'm now trusting you to become my savior. Now, if you do that in your mind, it's not so much a prayer. I want you to know that the Lord says, he that believes on me, in me, right now, has everlasting life. So you believe his words, that it's truth. Now you believe in him, and that becomes your salvation. Is there anyone in here today that's ready to say, I'm across the line, I'm trusting in Christ, I believe in him. I ascribe to him his worship. Would you slip up your hand? Is there anyone in here today that today is the day you're trusting Christ? Never done it before. Anyone at all? Okay, Christians, how about you? How about you for just a moment? As a spiritual ophthalmologist, would you like to perhaps use all your training of the message of the word of God, the clarity of the gospel, lovingly build a relationship and a bridge to a family member or friend, and then communicate that message of spiritual sight of salvation being found in Christ? Would you like to do that? How many of you know that you're going to be coming up and into, again, the lives of family members or friends and you'd like to have some prayer for humility but also compassionate courage and you'd like for me to pray for you?
Would you slip up your hand right now? I'd like to pray for you. Is anyone at all going to confront? Amen. Father, now as we bring this to a, a close for right now, we're closing the teaching time, but we're not closing the opportunity to worship you. And we worship you, yes, in song. But we also worship you with our lifestyle. And so, Father, we're going to worship you by taking that message of the precious gospel to those who don't know you. And so, Lord, I pray for those that are specifically going to go and be strong in you. And I'm asking that you'll give them compassionate courage to speak the message clearly and correctly that salvation is by grace alone and not by works. And by faith in you, that person could have eternal, eternal life. Now, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.